ladies and gentlemen, first of all, a very warm welcome to Court Chambers West Garth for the few people here who don't know me. My name's Michael De Rosario. I'm a partner in the Cyber Group here at Cause, um, and we're delighted to host Peter and Richard and Cyberminds and all of you here today. Um, I want to start by acknowledging that we meet on the unceded lands of the Wiradjuri people of the Kulin Nation and by paying my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Um, my first job is to throw to Peter, <laughs> who is going to introduce Cyberlights. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you all for coming tonight. I would acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, but also a cause who has kindly and generously hosted this evening's launch and indeed hosted the Sydney launch in June. Um, also to acknowledge our founding partners, the Government of New South Wales uh, and Tony Chapman and his role that he's played as an advocate and indeed Minister Dominello for his advocacy. We'll be seeing him again next week in Sydney at a 50-person CISO event where we'll be talking about this very thing. Also, um, uh, our other founding partners existing, uh, CyberCX, uh, Mimecast Australia, uh, Cause is a founding partner providing us with pro bono legal support. Um, we've got the support of ASA, the, the Cybersecurity Advisors Network, which is a hat that I wear. Um, also, we have, I'm trying to remember now, uh, but certainly to welcome Deloitte tonight as coming on board as a new founding partner, and particularly to thank Greg Janke and Ian Blatchford and, um, and Stephen Kintakis for their passion and belief and very. Uh, early acceptance of the value of what we're doing. Mimecast, do I mention? Um, and I'll try and think of the others before the night's out. I don't usually use notes, I just think, let the passion carry it through and maybe any errors I make will be overridden by the enthusiasm that you will soon feel for our project. Um, the project itself was born out of a recognition that I've been developing over the last several years, working in cybersecurity and seeing the beginnings of what we now understand to be burnout in our peers. Uh, I started trialling a program with the members of the Cybersecurity Advisors Network um, in Australia, and particularly during the pandemic, realised that we had something that we could deliver remotely that was effective. And indeed, having qualified to deliver the IRIS protocol, which is the central core delivery um, methodology and platform that we're using uh, in CyberMinds, realise that we have something that not only is effective and scalable, but also has about 20 years of prior application in the military. And so in, in a way, in a parallel sort of set of challenges, realise that there was an opportunity to bring what had already been tried and proven into the cyber community for the first time anywhere in the world. So I approached the founder of the IRS Institute, Dr. Richard Miller, who you will hear from shortly in a video, and said, look, this is the idea, has it ever been done before in cyber? He confirmed that it hadn't. And so from then it was really a partnership, a collaboration with the site of the IRS Institute. They in turn permitted us to deliver the protocol, to wrap it in the language of cyber. So the protocol itself is fairly uniform. It's been used in homeless shelters, as well as the military and palliative care facilities, drug dependency clinics. Uh, in a whole array of different therapeutic settings, um, but never, as I say, in cyber. So uh, the, the beauty is that the, while the protocol is uniform, that gives you the ability to measure across populations, which is important for us because a big part of what we're doing is measuring as we go. And you'll hear from Dr. Andrew Reeves shortly about how we're doing that. But the genius of the, of the system is that we can use cyber-specific language in the way that we present the protocol and the way that we deliver it. And for me, doing a pilot program with Alliance, the cyber team earlier in the year, as a proof of concept, recognised that that was a really great way in to people that may not have any familiarity with these kind of mental health protocols. And so that really validated the formula is really that this is a peer-informed program peer informed. Uh, we have a network within uh, Australia of 400 IRS trained facilitators. So we've got already an established pool from whom to draw for the delivery so that we know that we can scale this both in person 
but also because we can deliver online, we can scale in terms of the number of teams that we can simultaneously reach. Um, we're beginning pilot programs next week with CyberCX. We've got some in development with the New South Wales government as well. So we're kicking off with some pretty significant partners that have immediately seized the need for this and have found the funding for it, and we're ready to, to deliver right now. Um, what else can I tell you? The research piece. The other piece is the community. We think that there are three actual pillars to our model. One is the IRIS protocol itself. Second, as importantly, is making sure that this is a sustainable change in the industry. This is not something where you just go into a workshop, sort of set and forget, and then you're right. This is a long-term commitment into the ongoing uh, effectiveness and happiness of the teams that are securing the nation. So the community side will comprise groups of people that we're putting through our training where we can hold regular meetups like this. We can begin to normalize the conversation, bring in expert speakers, and really get people to understand that this is something where we're all helping each other. So that is critical. And the third piece is the research and the metrics piece. So together they become mutually uh, reinforcing aspects of the delivery of the protocol, which we can then measure, and then we create a community around the, all the people that we're working with. Um, I think that's probably all I wanted to say at this stage. We've got a lot of information on our website. I think I'd like to move to the Richard Miller piece now. Now, Richard can't be here in person, but we've got a video <coughs> where he talks about his use of the protocol in the US uh, with the military there, but also his enthusiasm to support this project here as we roll out. And I didn't say, but we're ready to launch in the US from the new year. So we're taking this internationally through the Five Eyes initially. And we've got, I've been to the US already last month, and we've got people that are ready to start rolling this out there as well. There are 4,000 facilitators in America and 7,000 worldwide. So as we bring them up to skill around cybersecurity, we've got something that could probably really move the needle on mental health across the entire sector. So those are my opening words. Thank you again for your attendance. And uh, let's move to Richard now, Alex. I think we need to initiate that video. Hello, everyone. I'm Richard Miller, the founder of iREST Institute and the developer of the iREST protocol, which I'm delighted to see CyberMinds bringing in to help with the issues that, and challenges that are facing everyone in the cybersecurity industry. I'm really regretful that I can't be with you all in person for this official launch of CyberMinds. But believe me, my heart and my entire enthusiasm is here today with you all. I'm, I'm truly delighted and excited to see the first dedicated application of the IRS protocol into the cybersecurity and related communities worldwide and its professional delivery through CyberMinds and our IRS facilitators. I understand that these are very unique and critical pressures that cyber defenders are under and how the IRS protocol is very well suited to address these and help build resilience and what I like to call an unbreakable sense of well-being in the people who go through this IRS protocol. I've been involved in research with the IRS protocol since 2004. I've studied this with many different populations across a broad spectrum of issues that are stress-related and looking at how to help people who are uh, experiencing anxiety, depression, and other issues when they're under prolonged or acute stress in their jobs or in their home relationships. What we've seen as people go through the IRS program in our research is what they say is they get back their joy for working. They're able to sleep again through the night. They are feeling rested both through the program, but also they're carrying that restfulness, a sense of resiliency, a sense of well-being into their workplace, as well as when they go home so they can make the transition much easier from work to home and from home back into work and integrate these principles into their daily life. 
people learn the tools of how to work with the stress in their lives, how to work with their emotions, how to work with the body sensations that come when people are under high stress, and how to work with the different thoughts that come, negative beliefs and other aspects when people are under tremendous acute and prolonged stress. So I'm really delighted that Cyber Minds is committed to bringing these teachings into the uh, cybersecurity industry. And just know that myself, my institute, and everybody who is working with me is really here dedicated to give tremendous support in anything that Cyber Minds needs as they move forward. So again, I wish I could be there with you in this moment but I am sitting here sending my, my deep and heartfelt congratulations to uh, Peter, the Cyber Minds Board of Directors, and all of you here celebrating this uh, momentous event. So thank you for bringing me in, and I look forward at some point to being with you in person. One thing I didn't mention while the microphone's coming back, on the back of your name tags, You'll notice three QR codes. Uh, the first one is really just a bit of the, more of the why of this, um, how we're going about the work. The second one is actually a um, 30, oops, sorry. The second one is actually a 35 minute demonstration of the protocol where you'd be encouraged to go home, put on a set of headphones, and you can actually try the protocol for yourself and you'll see how rapidly it will have an effect on just uh, uh, de-escalating stress, anxiety, helping you with sleep, getting you into a better frame of mind. The uh, neurology, the neuroscience around this is pretty well established. Richard said he's been doing research in this area for 40 years or more. Um, but there are many studies now that show neurological change after about eight weeks of practice. So part of the sustainability in the community aspect of this is keeping people experiencing the protocol in its different sort of flavors as we move through different themes. And over time, what you, when he talks about this unbreakable sense of, you know, of resilience or well-being, he's not, that's not a metaphor. I mean, that you really actually begin to feel that you can move into hugely challenging situations and still maintain your equanimity and balance. So I encourage you to um, try that for yourself. And also, last week, Richard Mogg and I were at ASA and we were doing pretty much back-to-back -back demonstrations over two days. Greg Janky came and had a try himself, but we found tremendous feedback we were getting from people just after one session. So we know it works, and now we're out to work with you to help get this out there and to help make a difference. So I'll hand back to Michael now to introduce the panel. Thanks very much, Peter. Um, Look, we have a, a bit of a discussion here about um, mental health in the cybersecurity industry. It's something that we've just not spoken about. Um, I think we all know that, particularly in times of, of breach and incident, um, the stress is something that we... Um, it, it's overwhelming, particularly for the people who are uh, on, on the front line, um, whether as you know, consultants like myself, or as um, in you know, people who work in the company defending against cybersecurity, um, there's an enormous sense of just overwhelming odds um, that, that you're up against. And um, one of the things that I think we forget as an industry, but I think more the point um, employers, companies forget, is that cybersecurity is, if you like, a specialised area within a, a very big field of IT. Um, and I like to liken it to the fact that you know, we train all these people to become cyber security defenders um, and then you know, they get to a stage where they break. And it's like training a bunch of fighter pilots, forgetting that they're really good jobs flying 747s. Um, we've got to look after our cyber security professionals um, across the industry. So that, that's, I think, Peter, what has attracted me um, to, to Simon Minds. It's just something that I, I've seen over and over again. And I know um, it's something that 
the, the people on the panel have, have, have seen. Um, I'm going to start by introducing John O'Driscoll. Um, John is, um, well, John was the state advisor um, up until about two months ago where he um, took on an over, we were talking about an overly hard job to become the CISO of the Justice Department um, here in Victoria. Um, John's got immense experience and uh, can talk about all, all of the things that um, happen at the government level. But, um, John, I think we'll be interested in your insights in relation to you know, the, the stresses of managing the issues of, of cyber at the government, um, in, in the government level. Um, sitting next to John is um, Kevin Short. Now, Kevin um, has 25 years' experience in the cyber security industry. Um, and you know, we're, we're being very real here, and, and Kevin has asked me to be very real. Kevin has recently retired because of the burnout associated um, with the pressures of this industry. And Kevin has taken on an ambassadorial role for Cybermines, um, really to raise awareness and to, I think, um, you know, make sure that it's okay within our industry to be talking about this. So, um, yeah, it's, it's an admirable thing, um, Kevin, and you know, we'll, we'll speak to you about your experiences for sure. Um, Dr. Andrew Reeve is a doctor of psychology. He's recently received his PhD, um, and he's looked at um, he, his doctor was essentially um, the psychology of cyber risk. Um, if, if I can summarise many years' work into four or five words, <laughs> but um, Andrew's on the board of Cyber Minds, um, and he's running. Um, what we what, what is the first baseline study of um, mental health in the cyber industry, and yeah, Andrew will be able to, to speak to that. Um, sitting next to Andrew is uh, Richard Bolt. Richard um, has had a decorated career. He's recently retired after 30 years in the army, uh, retiring the rank of lieutenant colonel. Um, he's an IRS facilitator. Um, he's trained with Richard Miller. Um, and he's been delivering the Irish protocol to the military in Australia since 2016. Um, and, and we'll hear from Richard about um, essentially how this helps, how, how it's an antidote for the, the problems that, that we have in our industry. Um, so against that background, first, first of all, anybody um, here who has a question for the panel, stick your hand up, I will give you the mic. Um, I, I think we want to start a discussion about this um, in our industry um, and make sure that we know, um, you know where, where we can, I think we, we just need to normalise talking about this. Um, I'm going to start, if that's okay, with John. Um, John, you've come from one big job, you've just taken on another big job. Um, tell us about the pressures associated with managing you know, large cyber security teams um, in, in government, particularly in the current environment, and um, where do you think something like Simon Lines has a place? Thanks, Michael, and thanks for the opportunity to come along today. Um, yeah, look, I've had 25 years in financial services, um, and you know, going back to my early days, um, I was an analyst programmer, and so I've cut code, and I was you know, pretty much hands on the tools. But that finished probably 15 years ago. And one of the biggest areas of stress I experienced was I used to be pretty good at the detail and now in my role, I'm kind of a jack of all trades, I'm not necessarily a master of anything. So um, it's really important that you surround yourself with really capable people. Moving in to become Victoria's first whole government CISO in October 2017 was a, a massive change for me. But um, every opportunity sort of opens up new experiences and a new way to grow as an individual. So when I came into that role, you know, the Victorian government, there's 1,960 entities that employ 340,000 public servants. Um, and when I came in, I said, so what are your expectations of me? And it was, well, this is a first up role, so um, you sort that out and come back and tell us. I'm like, great, okay, I've got a lot of flexibility there. But that can be quite stressful too because um, you're going to create it from scratch. So one of the things I found in government is that I can normally convince people that there's a need to do something, 
But when I try and get people to take on accountability for it, it's kind of a bit like this. And so I think in, as a cyber professional, we, not only do we need to do awareness, but we sort of have to change that into careness. They have to want to do something about it. And then, you know, I'm an optimist. I think people will do the right thing generally if you make it easy for them and they understand why. And so making things easy in government is, not, is, is a very challenging um, piece of work. So again, moving into the role, there were three people in the team. And when I moved across from um, the Premier and Canada to Justice about five weeks ago, the team had grown to 35. Um, is that what it should be in the future? Probably not. I think there will be increasing demands and expectations, but um, that team doesn't do cyber for all of the government. Why am I telling you this? Because a big part of a CISO's role is influencing people. Yeah. And <coughs> I was also doing, doing some research and the average life expectancy of a CISO in the role was 18 months. I went, 18 months, really? When I came, I thought, it can't be that hard. It is. It's really challenging. And in, in my earlier days, I used to do a fair bit of sport, um, you know, some distance running. You could always push yourself to the end when you knew the finish, where the finishing line is. In cyber, like if you think you get there, they just send you to do another marathon. So, and that's that's really challenging. So I've I've been fortunate, well maybe not so fortunate. I've created really good teams, and I've been able to um, have the team work together to support one another. And you know, sometimes indicating that you're experiencing stress. People think, oh, it's not a good idea to expose that, particularly if you're leading a, a stressful role. But it's interesting with CISOs, with my team, I say, hell, come tell me about it, and I'm here to help you. But when it comes to me, I probably don't fess up as much to others. My wife um, tends to be my you know, pillar of strength and support, but um, there's often things that I can't talk to her about. So I think the profession, yeah, it's, it's difficult. and. One of the other difficulties is that as a profession we talk too much techo stuff. So the average business person finds it really hard to understand. And if you can't convince people, you can't lead them. So I found having that really supportive um, group in my team has been amazing. But also there's you know, Kevin and myself are in other SISO forums. Sometimes just being able to have a conversation with somebody else. Um, you, know, you close the door, tell them how it's rules, and you just really say what's, yeah, <laughs> say what's on your mind. And then people come back and they say, oh, yeah, I've been going through that. Even just recognition that you're not weird um, is, is really important. So I was lucky I got to meet Peter a few months ago. And when he was talking me through this, I thought, wow, what an amazing opportunity. And we all know that there's um, su supply hasn't kept up with demand in cyber. And in government, it's even harder. We have to attract and retain talent when we're competing with the likes of some of the firms and financial services organisations. So if I can't have a healthy um, environment where my staff can learn to grow but also support one another, I'm really going to struggle to be able to recruit the right people. So again, when people were talking about this initiative, I thought, this is great because it's one thing to pay lip service to a need to do something, it's another thing to get right in behind it and, and support it. I was born and bred in Sydney, moved to Melbourne probably 11 years ago. And you know what, I'm sick of following New South Wales and a lot of their initiatives. Tony Chapman and I are great mates, we, we help each other on a day, day to day basis. Um, but it'd be great for Victoria to take a more prominent role in this and start to drive your initiative here because there's so much, so many people that need um, what you're offering now and unless we can help them, we'll never be able to attract and retain talent the way we need to. Well, I'd like to actually get you to hand the microphone to Kevin. <coughs> Kevin, um, I'm going to ask you a fairly open question. Could you tell us your story and how you got here? I'm giving you a free the eighty version of my That's story. Really nice. as you guys will be taking late night trains home. <laughs> uh, I've been in the industry um, in Australia at least for 23 years, had a very fortunate career. Actually, spent some time at Deloitte and grew Jackie's age quite a lot when I was <laughs> working for him. Um, so I've been around the traps. I've worked in financial services, critical infrastructure, um, the consulting side of things. Um, 
my last role was with a hyper growth company that, you know, in the time that I was in, 18 months went from 900 people to about 1,600 folks. Um, so a lot of pace and a lot of change on the go. You know, with John's point about, you know, having good teams and building good teams, it's one of those things, you, you invest a lot of time in your teams, you try to make sure it's a good, safe environment for them, you're developing your people, but you don't always go back and look at yourself and, and what you need in terms of support. And, you know, it was only recently, you know, prior to your retiring, I looked at him and went, you know what, I don't have anybody looking after me as an individual, never mind professionally, but mentally and mental health-wise, the way I look after my team. So with my team, I don't know if folks have come across Ubuntu, but we had Ubuntu running as a philosophy, which is basically, fundamentally, I am because you are. So you recognize the contribution of other people to your own success. And that's the way we were all as a team, but I just realized out of that, uh, outside of that, there was nothing on a, uh, on a higher level. Um, a lot of stresses with the roles, and this is one of the things I do enjoy about sort of, um, um, being in the position I am. I feel a lot freer to be able to talk about things that you couldn't when you were employed by organizations. A lot of CIO CISOs come to stress because they understand what the risk factors are and who the threat players are. They have a very hard time convincing organizations to change their behaviors and invest adequately to protect against that. And as we like to joke when we have our in-house therapy sessions, that CISO is often considered to stand for crisis-induced sacrificial officer. So, they, you know, you're the first person to be thrown under the bus. That aside, to, in my career, I, I ran through a number of organizations. Um, I got to the last organization that I was working in, and the stress levels started to get particularly high, which on its own I could manage. Give you a bit more background. Um, when I was younger, I was in South Africa, I got conscripted, uh, conscripted into the South African military, spent a couple of years running around um, in Angola at a, at a very particularly hairy time. And folks who, and, you know, Angie might know that what actually happens later on in life when you start hitting your 50s, that's when your testosterone levels drop, and that's when often PTSD resurfaces around things. So I was dealing with all the stresses of work, I was dealing with reoccurrences of PTSD that I had the experience for you know, 30 odd years. And then I ran into a bunch of you know, family things as well with health and you know, people dying and other bits and pieces. And all the stress just got too much. I ended up a couple of times on calls when I just had full blown panic attacks. Um, you know, I was just standing there and in my head I was having a different conversation. It was a parallel reality happening. And yet people who were talking to me were saying, you were just standing there, you were mobile, you're not moving. Um, I remember mentioning this to my wife and you know, she said, why are you working? I said, well, I'm bringing home the bacon. And she said, well, we don't need any more bacon um, and I don't want to be eating bacon on my own if you're dead because you've, done, you know, you've worked yourself into the grave. And she was a little bit surprised when I went and had it on the the next week. <laughs> but, you know, it was just one of those things and the timing was really, really good because it gave me an opportunity to decompress, focus on the family things I needed to focus on and then start thinking about what did I want to do in the next phase of my life. And at that stage, it was actually Malcolm Crompton, who was a former Federal Privacy Commissioner, and I were having a chat. And you know, I got the introduction through to, uh, through to Cybermines. It was that for the folks. So I think that's a really, really good initiative. What I am looking for, and having come on board, is you know, to help build up the ambassador program, is to be able to identify other seasoned senior security folks who are prepared to step up and talk about this issue in the industry and show some leadership and make it okay for junior people in the uh, in business um, to be able to come and feel it's a safe environment to talk about mental health. I think we owe it to a lot of people coming into the industry and existing in the industry to make sure that we uh, you know, enable them to look after their mental health while they do such a stressful and such an important role. Here we are. 25 years in Compass for two was at 90 seconds. You did superb. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. Um, Dr. Andrew, um, you're currently conducting a baseline study into the mental health of the cybersecurity industry. Do you want to take us through that and give a plug for that QR code that's behind everybody's head? I sure will. Hi, everyone. Plugging that QR code. Um, <laughs> So, 
my background is in psychology. I'm a psychologist by trade, uh, but my PhD is in cybersecurity, so I'm kind of across those two areas. That's how I know um, Peter. So um, one of the things we've discussed for a long time is the uh, pretty clear reasons why people who work in cybersecurity roles are under a, a huge amount of stress. I think um, there's quite a good amount of data coming out at the moment that actually things like burnout, turnover, um, uh, lack of psychological safety, these things are kind of rampant across the board at the moment. Um, but there are some pretty uh, convincing reasons as to why they're going to be higher in the cybersecurity community. So we've got a case where uh, success in, in cyber is often invisible. You know, no attacks happen for X years, no one really notices. Uh, but then a lack of success is incredibly visible and hindsight is 2020. So these people are under incredible amount of stress to, um, as you would know, to um, have to justify what they're doing in, in every moment of the day. So uh, we've seen a lot of different people talk about how it makes sense that this industry is going to be suffering from uh, increased turnover, they're going to be suffering from burnout, they're going to be suffering from different mental health conditions. But we realised there wasn't really any research actually out there at the moment that demonstrated that, um, which is what we're running at the moment. So as our first step, we wanted to take a, uh, a baseline. So we're taking an average of the whole industry, we're trying to get as many people to complete it as possible. And we're getting them to complete a uh, series of psychometric measures. They're the same sort of thing you would get if you ever went to a GP or something and you wanted to be referred to a psych for a stress condition. Um, so we're measuring burnout, we're measuring psychological capital, which is the, um, you know, often we get to the stage in where we feel like uh, any little thing is the straw that broke the camel's back. Um, so we're measuring sort of how close people are to that level. Um, and then we're also measuring sleep quality, which is something else that's come out from a lot of the discussions we've had. Um, I've had a quick look at the data, so take this with a, a grain of salt, because it is an ongoing project, and I do want you to, to take part. Um, but uh, it does seem like for a lot of these things, the level of particularly burnout is considerably higher than the Australian norm, as we would expect. Um, and we're also seeing that you know, sleep quality is, uh, is pretty low. On the, on the flip side, there was an interesting thing I saw on the way here, um, which is that even though people are reporting high incidents of um, things like emotional exhaustion, so feeling absolutely exhausted at the end of the day, you know, most people reporting that to be a few times a week or more. Um, they were also saying things like they're, they're proud of the work they do and they feel like they achieve uh, valuable outcomes. Um, there, were a, there was a, a fair percentage of the population that unfortunately said as well that they feel like the amount that they are appreciated at work is dropping. Um, but generally speaking, people seem to have an almost innate view that what we're doing is a good thing. So that is going to probably serve as a bit of a buffer. Um, but you know, sort of to what John was saying is if the people around don't fully understand the value that cybersecurity people are bringing, then it's only so long that that innate motivation can, can last and eventually you're going to burn out and turn over and go somewhere else. Um, so the study is ongoing. Please do take part if you can. You can scan the QR code and you can share that forward as well. Um, but, uh, you know, we're hoping to have the full results out next week, but we'll see how we go with the with the numbers, but I think this is going to be an ongoing thing. You know, we're not just going to take a measurement at one point. The point of us doing this is to see how things are tracking over time, um, particularly at, a, um, at an industry level. Um, we're kind of hoping it's not the case, but we expect that certain outcomes are probably going to diminish over time. We're going to see people being even more stressed or even more burnt out. So, um, just to bring it back to cyber mines as well, one of the uh, parts of the site capital that we measured was around the amount of support that the organisation seems to show to these people. And that was coming out as relatively low. And one of the ways you can demonstrate that you support these people and understand the, the stress they're under is by certain interventions such as cyber mines or other things like that. So the more organisations we can convince to get on board, I think, the better. Um, if you give the microphone to Richard. Richard, I'm um, going to ask you a very simple question. Um, how does IRS help? Good. Um, IRS is a guided practice which in its fullness is 10 steps, uh, 10 um, specific and deliberate steps which guide the person who takes up just usually just in a laying down position 
where they can completely rest. And they're guided to a position of deep rest, so like a, a pre-sleep state in which they are still still conscious but the body is completely at rest. And in that pre-sleep deep rest state, they're guided where they um, are activate their body's interoception through a, through a body scan, a bit of breath sensing, and in that deeply rested state, they're guided to welcome and allow any feelings or emotions that might be in their body. They're guided to do this to feel the sensations in the body, which is in that in that state is deeply restorative, where they're guided to not resist them and to, to allow them. And this, they then feel into an opposite emotion as well. They're guided, guided to hold both emotions at the same time. And they do this with thoughts as well in, in another set. They bring to mind any recurring negative thoughts they, they might have, feel them in the body. When they hold that thought to be true, how do they feel? Feel the opposite, hold both thoughts at the same time. Do the same with any negative beliefs. In this pre-sleep state, they then are guided to a place where they can reflect on these thoughts and emotions without being attached to them. So they're able to step back, welcome and feel and allow all of this happening in the body, but they're guided to a place of just being, being the witness, having a, a broader perception of what they're experiencing. And this guides them to a state of, of beingness, of, of awareness, and it activates several um, psychological and physiological processes that, that we can explain by brain waves, by uh, neuro, um, um, <clears throat> neuroplasticity effects and, uh, and hormones being secreted in the body. We can explain it in various ways, but deeply integrative, not pushing anything thing away, allowing and restoring a sense of wholeness, and deeply restorative as well. It's a bit of an outline of the process. Um, this technique, as we heard, developed by Dr. Richard Miller, and has a, a quite a profound research base, highly effective and safe, been used by the US military for about 15 years for post-trauma stress and also for building resilience, and also being used by different parts of, of the Australian military, starting to um, starting to be introduced into resilience programs and soldier recovery centres as well. I've had played a role in that in running some, some drop-in sessions at some of the barracks and job works over the years. I found it to be a very much a very accessible um, accessible practice and been, been quite amazed by the feedback which has been being achieved by those who have participated in the programs. Fantastic. Um, look, any, any questions? For the panel, I mean, this is something that you know we've also yeah. Please. I have so many questions. Um, <laughs> Stephen will tell you I've been preparing my list since last week. <laughs> um, my first one is firstly I found it really interesting. Sorry, my eyesight is of an age where I can't read your name badges anymore. That you mentioned, no one ever thanks you for working in cybersecurity. No one ever says you know woke up, have my money in my bank account, have my identity, good job. So there isn't that acknowledgement, obviously other than the Deloitte, um, that you're doing well, and I do think that plays into this. But one thing that really interests me about the whole Iris methodology is given that it was based in America and the military originally, if I look at obviously biological factors, you can think it's probably going to even out. But if you look at psychological and sociological factors, were there any challenges in adapting it to the Australian geek market? <laughs> That's only my first question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the mic's coming back, don't worry. I'm going to give it to Richard to answer that one. Sure, I might start off and then hand over to Peter as well. But um, the, I guess it's a very I guess a challenging area to, 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 to work in, in the US military initially. But the, the story that I'm aware of there is that there was a, one loan facilitated to start with at the Walter E. Military Hospital back in 2004. And she was um, delivering what is essentially integrated restoration, although at that point in time they were calling it something else. And the um, soldiers were waiting for a referral to a psychologist and a, and a um, psychiatrist. They, they had such a backlog of people that they weren't able to, to do anything. And, and this facilitator was running IRS sessions 
a lot of these people had done their sort of initial surveys and they'd sort of been diagnosed with um, very high level um, post-traumatic stress at a level of, of 80 uh, a percentile, where, where 40 is, is the level for a clinical diagnosis. And after several weeks of just doing this practice, they were subclinical, they were back down to that, that 40 percentile, which, which is quite amazing. And the US military at the time said, what are you doing? <laughs> can you do more of it? Can, can we put a study around this in order to, to um, get, you know, do a trial and, and, and document what you're doing? That then grew into what is now integrated with restoration and is being used at 83 um, veterans hospitals across, across the US. And beyond that population is rolled out to other populations as well. So getting, getting to your points, um, the, that's strong evidence base in the US military with a lot of research around it, but the same protocol is then potentially worded quite um, slightly differently, but the trauma-aware nature of the practice and the training which the IRS Institute provides all the facilitators does acquaint them with the sensitivities and the nuances to take it across those different sectors. So it's been used in for victims of human trafficking, um, sexual trauma, in homeless shelters, chemical dependencies, chronic, chronic pain, to, to, to name a few. In the, in the Australian um, context, um, to take it over to, to, to cyber, Peter has put together an induction program which all of our virus facilitators in cyber mines have gone through somewhere across the nuances of the particular stresses of this cyber community. And then the, the, the language that is applicable within that, that cyber community as well. But in the Australian context, there are now 400 virus facilitators which will be, be drawing on some of those as we continue, continue to scale. And they're um, already operating you know, across the Australian population now, so they'll be picking up you know, any nuances in, in language um, or you know, appropriate delivery within the Australian community. And then be, be trained also by us if they, if they are and going to facilitate for cyber professions. Um, almost nothing I can add to that, but. Um, being me, I'll find something. Um, the point is that the protocol meets people where they're at. It's designed to be very culture and neutral. And Richard Miller has trained 7,000 through his institute worldwide. It's in about 25 countries where it is being effectively used across multiple domains. So I don't see anything unique to the US military, uh, certainly culturally, for sure, but that's where we've got flexibility to adapt the language and the method in which it's presented, but the core protocol itself works across populations. The other point to note is that, you know, concepts like identity with profession or, um, or uh, identity with nationality or language or culture are all ultimately operating at a conceptual level within us through conditioning. What the protocol is, one of the main potencies of the protocol is we can go beyond that to aspects of ourselves that are fundamentally human that are independent of our language of our culture of our profession and so what the protocol does actually is really interesting with a lot of mental health interventions they start with what's wrong with the person that's presenting so if your anxiety what's wrong why are you anxious and you go into that with iris richard's turned it around and we start with what's not broken about them what's whole, what is unaffected, what's, what's, what part of them is, is, uh, ex could be accessible to them if they were shown where to access it. And so we use that as the foundation. That becomes the platform from which resilience is built. So it's turning it on its head. So, and, and I think my final point to really target your question is that aspect of self that is unbreakable is also beyond language, culture, uh, profession. And so on. So that is where we head with the with the protocol as we're going into the deeper states. That you can start to look at uh, culture and the influence that it's had on you, and, and learn how to be with it, but not identify with it. And that's part of the issue here: is this identification with the fear, identification with what might go wrong, identification with my inability to feel support from my management or my team, 
identification with the idea that I'm not doing a good enough job. We've gone through and we've looked at about, I think, 15 factors at least that inform what is driving the pathology within cybersecurity mental health. And we're going straight in and we're cutting that all away and taking them beyond that so that they can go back and look at those things and no longer be bound by them. So there's a huge opening up and a liberation. And this is where, I mean, Richard and I have been practicing this technique for a long time. You do really get to a sense where you could go into a situation that is highly stressful and traumatic and you just, somehow it equips you to just move through it. It's super powerful. I mean, I really urge you to try the technique. I can talk about it, Richard can talk about it, but when you taste it, then you'll see what we mean. <laughs> no, I Greg. Thank you. I'm not sure what my question is in a minute, but I'll, I'll, I'll get there. But first, let me tell you about the technique. I failed because I fell asleep four times, and I said that. Anyway. That's not failure. That's not failure. Um, I think Peter just hit on what I was thinking of is, is we're obviously in the business of resilience, not repair, and, and, and mental health is not just in cyber, but it's pervasive in society, but we need to address it. Coming through, we talk about supply issues, and I talk, and then this is one of the reasons we're looking at the Cyber Academy component of saying you know, how do we bring people more talent through. And I, my observation in being in this space for a long time, and it's scary because uh, unlike, unlike John, I was never hands-on technical and deep, you know, I've, I've, I've got an accounting background, coming into this space, we're getting many people from different walks of life. And they've got a specialisation because it's broad and it's deep in a lot of areas. And one of the things that we're looking at, and this is what I'm interested in, we've got some smart people, high IQ type individuals. EQ is a big issue, I think, and, and how do we balance that? So if I look at people coming through with resilience, what are their non-technical attributes would I be looking at from a, a good candidacy of an individual coming into this space that you'd be looking at you know, from, a, I suppose, a non-technical background? What sort of other behaviours, competencies and things of that if we look at in regards to understanding someone who could be very successful and resilient in this space. Fantastic. I've got a question for John and pretty much on the spot. Um, how are you going to be Tony Chapman? Oh, fitting war. Fitting war. Well, I'll ask you my role longer than Tony. Um, so that's, that's <laughs> no, no, I mean in relation to Simon Lines and getting this out. Yeah. Even the Victorian government space. Well, I guess um, to be able to bring about change, you have to be able to put a case. And I think the research that you're working on now is awesome. I keep saying to my team, um, government needs data driven policy, yeah. not policy based on gut feel. So I think being able to show evidence um, and then um, drive change. My team also say to me, John, cyber's hard. Yeah. And I said, yeah, and we do hard. And maybe a bit like Peter, I also say, now's the time. Like, if it's not us, who's going to make our change? You know, if it's not now, when's it going to be? But I, I think, you know, I, I come from a strong military family. I've got two of my children who have been in defence, one of them still is, uh, and defence works as a solid and functioning unit, not by one person, but by a group of people that work in uh, together. And so that's my challenge, I guess. That in government, there's some of the most passionate uh, people I've ever come across in my working life. And I have a minister who is really focused on wanting to do not just what's right, but um, what's needed to be done as well. So I think, again, it's a case of being able to, if you want to bring about change, you've got to communicate it, you've got to have a story, and you've got to have a solution um, that you can work with. And I think if we can demonstrate that we're prepared to, to go through the program, that, that's another indication that we're eating our own dog food, I guess, yes. mm -hmm. and you're more inclined to get people to, to get on board with it. So that's where that answers your question. Sounds good, Kelly. Can I just respond? Um, one easy way in is through a pilot program. So we're very happy to do sort of small scale things. 
Um, with the study that with Andrew's put together and is running under our banner, um, one thing he didn't mention uh, is that we need your organisations to participate. It's anonymous, so the end user is never identified. We can give you an aggregate report, though, that shows where your team is sitting in relation to the rest of the industry. And in fact, these, the metrics that Andrew has selected have existing Australian uh, norms. So we can measure where your team sits in relation to other teams in fewer organisations and also where they sit in relation to the general population. We hope that in turn, that will help you build the internal business case to run out more of the programs because the other thing is that that metric that we give to you may be the baseline for your organisation. We can then measure against that to show how that changes as they run through the program. So I think we're, we're, I've got a scientific background as well um, from a prior career and I know having worked in industry policy and the internet, uh, so much of our policy was not data driven and I really think, particularly now that we're moving to the US, they want to measure everything. And so it's just a gift in the way that this whole creation has come about that the people are just presenting that have got exactly what we need when we need it. And Andrew's come down from heaven, as it were, with this amazing research capability and we've built it right into what we're doing. So thank you, Andrew. Hey. <laughs> uh, I think that covers the main point. Um, yeah, no, thank you, Peter. You're too kind as always. Um, yeah, no, it is a very good point you brought up that a, a big part of what we're doing is that we want to be able, I mentioned that we want to be able to track the industry over time. We also want to be able to track certain organisations over time, so we are able to provide a report that says here's how your particular industry is sitting in, in, uh, in comparison to uh, the rest of the industry, but we're also going to say here's how your particular organisation sits uh, against itself six months ago or 12 months ago or however frequently we're able to collect that data, hopefully through interventions such as sidelines and, and, and other internal interventions you're doing, hopefully we'll see an improvement over time with that. But, um, you know, to get back to the point of data-driven policy, you know, we need to be targeting the, 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 the what's going to give us the biggest bang for our buck and also where the real problems are. There's no point going after, um, you know, it, and that's the thing, it'll be different organisation to organisation. So in one organisation you might find that it's a real cultural issue, there's not an understanding from, say, the senior management about the stress that cyber are under, and so you need to target that. But in another organisation that might not be the problem, it might be something completely different. So uh, by taking this first, I guess you call it a needs analysis, or if you use an old term, to say where's actually the problem and then target that and then re-measure and hopefully see improvement over time. Easy. I was like, how do you know my name? I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've only been working in cybersecurity for two years and I've found that a lot of cybersecurity professionals tend to be a little jaded or negative. <laughs> um, and I think part of that, as I think John mentioned, um, you, know, you can't really talk about what you're dealing with with your partner or with family, talking with your colleagues. and. Um, I think we all, uh, these conversations at work tend to turn into quite a negative or toxic um, cycle or conversation where it just, you know, spins out of control. And I was wondering, one, how do we keep those conversations, you know, where your colleague feels listened and heard, that's the same thing, where they feel heard, but also, keeping it in a way where it's still, um, you know, a productive or constructive conversation. And secondly, I was wondering, has the protocol, you know, in groups, you know, has the protocol um, helped with how peers communicate with each other? And yeah, that was the question. Thank you, it's really, really good questions. Um, Do you want to say when I heard cynical, I thought my name had popped up there. <laughs> but I'm probably as guilty as anybody else. And, you know, you get to the stage and frustrations get to you. And when you're under a lot of stresses, um, you know, it's only natural sometimes to look at the negative side of things. When you look at it from a leadership position, though, this is exactly what you need to shelter your teams against. Right? And John and I have been talking about this. So, you know, I've been in situations where there have been a lot of 
conversations, very honest, frank conversations about the issues that we're facing, but they tend to be in the peer group, so you're talking to um, fellow scientists and things. So you can shelter the team from these things, but I think it's really important that people are very realistic about the pressures and the demands on individuals when you get into this industry, and particularly what is associated with the career path you choose within that industry. So we would be doing a disservice if we didn't describe it accurately to people coming in. Uh, so that's the first one. That's the second one I love so much about. Southern Minds, it's also like you're two years into an industry where people are talking about mental health, where people are bringing mechanisms in to support where it's, you know, it's safe, or getting safer to talk about it. It wasn't the case when I was two years into the industry. Very much as soon as somebody spoke about, you know, I'm burnt out or I've got a mental health issue, the response from the organization was, this one's broken, it's going to be another, I don't need to introduce you. <laughs> <laughs> myself here. Right? So there wasn't a lot of, because organizations looked at you and the security team as being their guardians, as the gatekeeper, and keeping the barbarians at bay, and if you were talking about stress, then they go, you're not functioning at the right level, therefore you're putting us at risk, we'll go and get another, rather than, what do we do to support you? How do we make you more efficient? How do we make you more resilient? Because you've got all this knowledge and experience and things. So hopefully that answers your question to some degree. I think, but the problem is really, really real. You know, I was sitting down with a couple of other sizes maybe about six weeks ago in one of our quarterly meetups, just very informal. It's almost like an unofficial therapy group that we go to that cry on each other's shoulders. I joke a little bit. But we sat down and we went through it. And since the start of COVID, we could name 15 people in Australia who were all at 10 years plus in the industry, size over head of security level folks who've left the industry. They've either gone to Vendorland because funny enough they find selling less stressful than actually doing, or have just gone, that's it. To reiterate on that point, ASA conference last week, when I was saying, look, I'm out, I'm not in London, we're working full time in the industry, I'm doing this. The amount of folks that came up to me quietly, one on one, going, I'm thinking of leaving, what advice have you got? You know, mm -hmm. can I be a virtual sizer? And a lot of people are looking at things like virtual sizer, they say, feel it's going to be a less stressful uh, position to do. So if you're getting that, I apologize on behalf of myself and my peers because we shouldn't be getting folks coming into the industry feeling negative about all of this. But you do need to be realistic about the huge cultural change that needs to go on in Australia, particularly in organisations, particularly at board level, and particularly within the executive, because we've got a long, long way to get them up to the levels where they treat cyber and the people who are you know, executing it on their behalf appropriately. I, 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 I agree with that. I, I might just also add, I think um, we all have some responsibility to address the issue that, that you raise. I mean, we're notorious for dank memes and darkness. It's just the nature of our industry. Um, but, and that's a, a really valid coping mechanism for a lot of people. Um, but um, you've got to put peer support alongside that. And you've got to have um, you know, companies um, that uh, stand with, and not behind or in front of, but with their, um, you know, their, their cyber security staff and their IT staff um, because they're asking them to do a pretty difficult job. Um, and, you know, a bit like, you know, internal lawyers or anything else, you, you're seen as a cost centre in the company, you're not seen as an advantage or a strategic advantage. Um, so, yeah, I think um, as, a, as, as a group, um, whether you're, you're part of this industry in the professional services, or you're in industry, or in, you're in product sales, um, I think it's probably something that we need to call out and then come together and be a bit more supportive of each other. I think too, Izzy, yeah. um, I think sometimes um, we as cyber security professionals are part of the problem because we'll often say a business will come to us or a project, we want to do something. No, you can't do that because of this. So I've said to my team, flip on the head, say, oh yeah, you can do that as long as we mitigate this risk of X, Y, and Z. And it just changes the conversation. And that way we can be more positive. Because I hate to be like a speed hump on a Friday afternoon when somebody comes and says, this is going to go live on Monday. First of all, why didn't you engage me further? 
um, and I'm not the police. And the other thing is, I'm not prepared to own your business risk as well. And sometimes we sort of take that on. So I think you can't change what's happened happens to you. You can only change the way you respond to it. So I think there's a, a real opportunity for us to pivot and then change the way that we focus and engage with our stakeholders. George. I was just oh, gonna, sorry. I just more wanted more. to pick up Izzy's second question around the team dynamic. I asked Richard Miller this very question. I said, what have you noticed in teams when you start to introduce the protocol into a team environment and we like to do groups? He said, it's really interesting. He says, when they do the program together, they start to develop a common language around the protocol itself. We use certain terms within the protocol that are sort of triggers that's probably the wrong word, that are, are, that, that are code or map to certain aspects of the protocol that we bring in. And it's sort of like a shorthand thing, but what he said was that people start to use those in conversation as reminders to their friends. If someone's falling down, they'll say, remember this. So there's something about the protocol itself that becomes a common uh, resource that you may forget at one point, but you know that your teammate will remember and then they'll bring it up and, and it becomes a, a cohesion in the group. And when I um, did the pilot program with Allianz this year, uh, two things I noticed about that. One, they brought two disparate teams together uh, in different aspects of the organisation that uh, had, had some uh, issues working together. And they found that by bringing them together into the same program, it sort of created a bond that wasn't there before. So there is something around having common purpose, around a goal that is, let's say, a little more altruistic than just the day-to-day, -day, but something that is answering to a higher call within the, the team. And the other thing was that the, um, they did say, we felt really good that our organisation cares enough about us that they're prepared to invest in our well-being. And one of them said, this is the first time we've ever done anything like this. And so there was a real, and when we talk about return to work and people coming back from remote working in COVID, one of the things also is that we're building this in as a reason to come in to the physical location. You actually build return to work around delivery of the protocol. So it becomes a fun thing that they can do, that they feel amazing after, and then you have the team there. So there's a whole lot of layers where if you're smart and you work with the leadership to actually develop strategies where you can leverage it not only for mental health, but also to deliver on some of your, your other objectives. Thanks for being Dr. George. It's always one. <laughs> um, yeah, sorry, just um, on the back of John's comment there, I think when I was head of security here, uh, I remember when I started, I took that approach of we are not the school of no, um, we say yes, but, um, and that made my life a lot easier, which I think removed a lot of stresses because people were very forthcoming and you know, we'd have those conversations rather than stuff just happening in the background. But my actual question, I guess, is around who, you know, this is accessible to, but we're talking about cyber teams and organisations taking this up. Um, so yes, I'm at Deloitte. Um, in the evening, one day a week, I, I teach um, postgrad students in um, cyber terrorism, cyber warfare, like that sort of, you know, training people hacking countermeasures, all that sort of fun stuff. Um, and I think, you know, having been in the industry a long time and having had my fair share of burnout and I think imposter syndrome at times, I feel like there's a lot of um, folks that are coming up in the industry that are going to experience that. I mean, I did when I was in the States, that's, you know, when I was over there for a few years, that happened to me at the very beginning. I was like, oh my God, it felt like a real fish out of water. Um, is this something that would be accessible to, you know, um, or is there a, a view, maybe it is, I don't know, but uh, to folks that you know aren't part of cyber teams maybe you know i've got a i think i've had about a thousand students come through um that are going to be you know those cyber leaders of tomorrow um but you know they have real problems now where they may have issues with um you know knowledge gaps or they may feel like they, they maybe they have imposter syndrome you know is that type of support potentially available to them i'll grab the mic back um. I might just say something before passing on. I, I think that's a call to arms. Um, Cyber Minds is a not for profit, but the um, IRS trainers all deliver very, very valuable um, you know, courses 
um, as they're living. So one of the things I think it's incumbent upon us to do is uh, effectively find ways to fund that sort of thing. So that, that's an opinion of mine, but I'll um, pass it over to um, the panel. Um, anyway, I don't add to that. I'm not sure if I can fully answer your question, but I had a thought. Um, I think particularly talking about the protocol that we're delivering here, I mean, the, uh, the point you're about um, imposter syndrome is, I think, to get the nail on the head there, I think that's super common in the side of industry to feel that, and probably in a lot of industry. Um, and one thing that I've observed is that as soon as you have that anxiety, that stress of maybe, a, you know, the one they should be asking, and who am I to tell these people what to do, etc. You've already heightened your stress up to a certain level, and suddenly all of the things that you actually probably do know quite well, you can't quite articulate as well as maybe you would otherwise. And it's that classic thing where you have a meeting with someone or um, a running with someone, whatever happens to be, and you get home and you realise, oh, I should have said this or I should have said that. You know, in the moment, you've heightened yourself, and it's so much harder to actually think clearly. There are neurological reasons for that. The brain literally starts to move sugars and other resources away from the prefrontal cortex where we do our thinking. So it's almost like when your computer's overheating, when you're in that level, you're operating at 20% of what you'd otherwise do. So protocols like this and other similar things like mindfulness that are trying to um, educate people how to bring themselves. If you're you know, skyrocketing up to an eight over 10 anxiety, here's some in the moment things you can do to get yourself back down to a five or a four or a three out of 10. So it doesn't fully solve the imposter syndrome problem, but it, I think it can help people leverage the knowledge they do have. There's a lot of people coming out, I think, probably do know a lot more than they give themselves credit for. Yeah. That partially answers the question. Does anyone else want to? I can yeah. Yeah. add a little bit to that. Give it to the Give it to the Thanks, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> also, maybe catch me if you can. Um, I think the imposter syndrome is there, even 25 years into the career, the times you're standing and you're going, you know, am, I, am I as good as my peers? Am I really here? Should people really be listening to me? You never really get away from that side of things. I think you know, protocol and, and peer support and approaching this from a community basis certainly helps with that. I think you, know, you may raise a good point there, Andrew, about the, the preparations for, for meetings and where the sugar's going. One of the things that adds a lot of stress to folks in security, particularly your, your heads of security, is so far the lack of access at a meaningful level up to the senior executive and particularly to the board. So, you know, often, you know, when you're in front of the board, you've had five seconds to put a telephone di direction down the back of your pants because you know you're going to get kicked in the bum. And you've only been called up there because something has gone wrong or they think something's going to be. And because you haven't had that familiarity in terms of communication with people, those stresses go right through the roof. And then the society are not representing your group and your capabilities effectively. Too. And it becomes a self sort of loop that, that comes on the go. So I think it's probably part of the problem, probably didn't talk too, too much about it. It's, it's also giving you the ability to be able to operate in very stressful environments at a very high performance level as well. And I think on multiple levels, whether it's a size or whether it's people in security operation centers, you know, you do want to make sure that those people have A, got the resilience, but also got the ability to perform in environments that are very stressful. So I don't think I answered anybody's question with that, but I thought I'd share it. That would been very useful insight, Kevin. Um, Alex, you might have to turn the camera on to yourself. I was going, I was going to uh, move next to you. Fair One sec, yeah. <coughs> Sorry, I, I had a question in mind, and I was uh, listening to George's question, and it made me think that the question I had, I was hearing in George's question, just in a different perspective, talking about students. So I want to ask uh, Peter and the panel, you know, how soon will it be before cyber mines is just a standard part of the induction into getting into cyber security? How soon is it going to be before students are getting it? Say they're too, and you know, that starts young. Uh, so how soon will it be? I mean, CyberMind is less than a year old, the protocol is less than 20 years old, but um, can we see this becoming a standard part of the induction and in, uh, in students in the future? Um, absolutely critical. I mean, I've thought through the skills issue, and to me there's two dimensions to the skills crisis. One is, first and foremost, can we move quickly to shore up and restore the mental health of those that are already in the industry. 
that have all that corporate knowledge, that professional knowledge that is on the brink of being lost if they do what Kevin suggests or, and that he did and that others uh, that he knows have done. Uh, so first and foremost, we have to stem the flow of loss, the attrition. Secondly, though, I think we have a moral and ethical obligation, knowing as we do now the high-risk occupation that this is from a psychological standpoint, and the studies will show that. I mean, they're already suggesting that. You know, there is a duty of care, I believe, as are those that are inviting in new people to enter the profession not to leave them over the precipice, that we're not using these people as just the means of production, cannon fodder as it were, but we actually have to equip them with not only the skills to survive, but also the skills to thrive in this profession. And that means building within them a resilient neurology. This is not some sort of cognitive trick where we're gonna give them pet talk that says, you're okay, you know, just, say this mantra or whatever, not that I have anything against mantras, but um, the protocol is working at an incredibly powerful and subtle level where it actually does reconfigure the neurology. And the point is that if you were going into a battle, wouldn't you want to have the best equipment? Wouldn't you want to have the best, wouldn't you want to be at the peak of your performance, at the peak of your fitness, and know that you're going to be able to sustain that after the first, second, third, fiftieth challenge that lies ahead? And to know that you've got a team that's backing you all the way and a management that is backing you and resourcing this, this is the challenge. So I think we're talking to one or two academies now that are bringing in new entrants into cybersecurity. You know, there's a big push for diversity, for inclusion, for uh, neuro neurodiversity, for gender diversity. But how, how much are we looking at each of those groups that we're inviting in and going, what is our duty to them? in this regard, because otherwise I think we're rendering a great disservice. How would we like to feel in five or 10 years time when someone comes to us and says, well, you lured me into cyber security, you promised me the earth, and all you've delivered me is the inability to sleep now, or to relate to the people around me. So I think, you know, we've got this, I think there really is this very human aspect to what we're doing here that has to become part of the understanding of what it means to work inside security in 2022 and beyond. Could I maybe just add a tangible um, response to that? Your question about the question about universities and interests. I spoke on mental health at the ASA conference last week. I've already had two large Victorian universities reach out, wanting to catch up, wanting to have a conversation, wanting to join an advisory panel. So I think we have no chance to discuss that. But, yeah, yeah, a lot of folks are actually looking at this and they're coming from the point of view of uh, an ethical obligation to students to give them this capability. I think there is a good point around OHS. Um, like if you look at the mining industry, how they've done a lot of work and um, losses, physical harm is unacceptable. Yet in cyber, you know, we've got more and more security operations centers coming online. And if you're a poor stock analyst, you get flogged to death for maybe three years. And then when it's all too much, you get spread out the other end. So yeah, I, I agree. I think that as an employer, we're very fortunate that people want to work for us, and that comes from the motivation to um, protect our staff as much as possible and make the mental environment as important as the physical LHS. <coughs> Fantastic. One more. Yeah, <laughs> like <laughs> Um, Peter, I thought it was really interesting you mentioned the neurodivergence. Because I think as an industry, we're very good at doing that. We welcome you if you're neurodivergent. Now sit down and be treated just like everybody else. Mm -hmm. Have you got any thoughts on that? And I'm kind of thinking along the lines of what I say, you know, Asperger's can be a great asset for some type of work. Mm -hmm. But it also comes with comorbidity for stress, depression, and so on. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I've ever worked for an organisation that's addressed that point. Mm -hmm. This is um, a really good question. This question came up at the Sydney launch as well. How, how well are we addressing neurodiversity? And I think I always come back to the, what we're taught when we're trained in delivering the IRS protocol is you meet people where they're at. So we're, we're inviting them in to come in as they are with whatever they're bringing. 
If it's anxiety, we, we give them a safe space with which to be with their anxiety. Learn how to, what happens is, you may not necessarily weigh it. You can't get rid of anxiety by wishing it away or, or even acknowledging that it's there. But what you can do, as John indicated, was you change your relationship with it. You change your, you can't change the external world. Richard Miller again, he says, uh, if, you, uh, if you fight with reality, reality will always win. Well, we're under a constant cyber attack environment. That is not going away. So how do we change our relationship to those fixed elements within our working environment and also to the way that we perceive ourselves? Which goes to George's point about imposter syndrome. You know, a lot of what the, the personal growth, if you like, that comes through doing this internal work, it's not only building psychological resilience for you in the workplace, it's building how you respond to life. You know, you're, you're not just a uh, nine to five or whatever it is in cyber, nine to, nine to midnight, uh, seven days a week individual that's in a job. I mean, you have so many aspects of your being that are impacted by your neurology and by the stress and, and what you're living day to day. So how do we change, how do we reframe what it means to be working in cybersecurity. How do we get over the idea that I am not good enough to talk to these leaders? I mean, that ultimately is a function of the internal dialogue, which is the thing that is sometimes our greatest uh, impediment. The, 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 it's, the, it's, the, it's the things that we tell ourselves, the inner narrative, that in some times can be our biggest enemy. So how do we change our, we not, we're not saying you stop that, but how do, you, how do you see that for what it is? And to do that, you need to create somewhere that is separate from those thoughts so that when they start firing up, you can go, I know you, you were here last week. But you see, when you can shine a light on that, that conversation, it loses its power over you because you, stop, you can learn how to stop believing it and just live in what, what's, what's now. And when you do that, an amazing thing happens. You flip out of the neural net networks that are tying you into anxiety, limbic system activation. And where, where are you flipping back into? You're flipping back into the control centers, where you want to be, which is all about focus, clarity, calmness, joy, rediscovering the purpose of why you came into this. That's where, this is, this is your true home. This is where you, we want to reacquaint you to that in an experiential way, in a somatic way. So it's deep, but you've got to try it. I mean, again, we're talking about, we're, we're, we're trying to explain to a fish what it's like to live in the ocean. You know, it's like we're so close to this now that we don't really stop seeing what's actually happening. So. I don't know what you would say to a fish at this point. Don't go here, here, here's a bicycle. But, uh, <laughs> here's, here's a periscope. Yeah. Yeah. I think on your point on you, the neurodiversity is a, is a really good one because you have got a, a, a bunch of folks that do work in very deep technical... Um, some people think it's ironic that I need a microphone given the but there are, you know, neurodiverse people. There's a lot of people with Asperger's and other you know, elements in that spectrum that are very, very good technically in environments, but do struggle with interpersonal relationships, have different needs, different stresses that hit them. These folks, you know, I'm one of them. You've got ADHD, but they bring certain stress because when everything turns to custom, there's a lot of things happening. It's a chaotic environment. That's what I'm comfortable in. So it enables you to operate. So I think, you know, what maybe some of the unintended consequences of you know, cyber minds and conversations about mental health should be getting organizations to the position where people who have, are, have these other uh, neurodiversity feel that can be adding some value to the org. Not just being tolerated, but being respected for what the capabilities they, they, they bring that, um, with that, I can't really use the word condition, but with the neurodiversity that they have. Is that closer to what you were mm. asking about? Yeah. You might have to wrap up with um, Can I get one last one? You can have one last one. <laughs> there was someone else, I think. So, was there a different? You need to share this. So, I just want to add to that point. 
when you talk about like neurodiversity, obviously you've got like a lot of um, collaboration you're doing, but are you, are you actually working with organisations that do specialise in, in autism and you know, various neurodiversity kind of issues, specifically those kind of organisations that actually have those neurodiverse people on their boards and not just people talking for them? Do you have them communicating with you to like build your, your program? We're only four months old, so, you know. I mean, that's that very young. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're working on uh, a program. I think what, what we're saying is we recognise that mm -hmm. and the protocol already speaks to it. Even if we didn't know they were neurodiverse, coming in and doing the protocol, they will benefit from it without us having to customise or change anything because it invites them to bring in what they're working with right now. We don't even have to know. It's very confidential what's going on internally. We don't delve into it. This is not therapy in a traditional sense. This is you, us facilitating you to do the work on yourself. Thank you. Yeah. Julia. Final question, I promise. My final question, I'll kind of start with a question, is how can we help you? And the reason I'm asking this is, in a sentence I never thought I would utter at a site of all them. There were not enough men in this room. Yeah. It's like one in 20 in cyber is female, and yet here we've got 50-50. Yeah. So, I mean, there's this whole contingent who are living the masculine, alpha male, you know, to your points earlier, you know, I'm at the top, no one's caring for me. And you then get into the whole toxicity of, I can't ask for help. Mm -hmm. And they're the people who need help. Yeah. How do we help you reach out as an audience? I think that's a good segue to this ambassador program. Yeah, a really good segue. Over to you, Tim. Segue. It's not writing a segue, taking a segue. Um, so I look, that, that's a, another really good question, and thank you for it. What we are going to have to do is get a number of um, folks out there who are going to be very strong advocates for the program. And what I'm looking for when I'm supporting you know, Southern Mines and building this program is identifying folks who have got a passion, who understand about you know, the mission of, of cyber mines, the need in the industry, um, who are in leadership positions who can actually fly the flag, if you will, uh, and be able to feel comfortable talking about mental health in their organisations, about being able to establish environments where it's a safe space to be able to speak about mental health and provide that support. So just those little ink blots that we can start and building up around the industry in Australia is the humble start, I think, that we're going to go for. Um, hopefully that would answer your question. I would love to see other um, you know, cyber security professionals, particularly men, um, challenge this notion of that you've got to be tough, you've got to be quiet, you can't let anybody know that you're struggling with things. I think the more we do that, um, the, you know, the more the problem will persist. Um, I think going back to, you know, to some of the references to the military, what I do like to see these days, and in Victoria, we've got a thing called the Blue Green Machine, which is taking veterans out on, on four-wheel drive bush trips um, to help deal with PTSD, is that there's a greater willingness these days around your so-called alpha males to talk about mental illness, to talk about support, to talk about their needs. We're not where we need to be, but there's certainly a hell of a lot more conversations going on now than there was five or 10 years ago. So, Early days, but I'm, I'm optimistic that the change will come through. Um, so that pretty much describes what I was. So um, John touched on it in the sense that if we do something to make change, who will? Um, the the um, a lot of great things. Um, uh, you know, you told us about your personal career, can um, touch so many things that I went through, right? Oh, that person, or that copy machine's broken, replace them. Um, so a meeting came to me earlier this year and said, hey, you know, what's the likelihood we can get Deloitte on board to, to support the launch Victoria? I was like, let me ask a couple of questions. And um, one of the people was the person next to me, Greg, and the other person in Sydney as well as Adrian and Renee. There wasn't even a, here's five questions that got up before, yes, it was like, yes, absolutely. Um, so yeah, to your point, uh, Julia, I, early in my career was very much one of those, um, well, not, maybe much isn't the right word, um, but uh, very headstrong and stubborn, right? Thinking, oh, I'm highly intelligent, I can just intelligent my way through this, right? There's nothing wrong. 
But, um, you know, uh, now I've been, you know, 20 years into this, so 18 and a half I'm an undergraduate. I recognise with the graduates and you know, people at different levels that I coach and mentor that I don't want them to uh, not have the support that was needed that didn't exist to join Kevin and the other speakers' points years ago. Uh, granted, we also have a generational jump. I like to still think that I'm younger than what I actually am, but I realise that I'm not. Uh, but we have a lot of people that enter cyber later in their careers as well. It's not just the young people coming in, it's also people that are actually moving in. And thankfully for that, because we are short on numbers, but, you know, the mindful thing that if we don't actually do something about avoiding burnout, then we are bringing people in, they're going to exist in the space even less than many of us up to this point, and they're out the door again. At that point, it's like, what do we achieve? Uh, so yes, um, while I'm not um, across the line yet, we are in the works to it. So uh, the research that was uh, spoken about, um, we have received that, we're just jumping through all the hoops, but this is just the beginning of us is what we can do. Um, and then likewise, I'm planning also um, some other organisations that John and I are both uh, board members of, representatives of, to try to take that elsewhere naturally as well. So this is hopefully the beginning of um, a much bigger thing. So I don't know, in a couple of years from now, I'll be somewhere else already here, standing and talking about this alongside a lot of people in this room and hopefully others. And we're trying to push this um, to the point that I think you know, you um, asked as to how long is it until this becomes part of the norm where, hey, I'm certified in this, but I'm also experienced in that. Um, and I think that that's going to put us in a much better place. So, um, yeah, um, this is the beginning. Thanks. Fantastic. Thank you, thank you Sam. And look, um, thank you, everybody. Um, this has been a remarkable discussion. I, I, I'd say it's been a better discussion than what we had in Sydney, I think. Mm -hmm. um, we were... There was, there was much, go Melbourne. Go Melbourne. <laughs> it, was, it, it was much more frank and much, much open, much more open. Um, look, some really good questions um, from younger members of the profession, which I think um, you know, I encourage you guys to, you know, not, not just get involved in this, but, but um, become leaders. We need, you know, Gen Z um, to help us get this right because, you know, I, I'm a Gen Xer. Um, some of these people might even not even be that. Um, and we haven't got it right yet. So, you know, this, um, this, this, this is something that we need to, to fix. Um, I do want to plug the study behind. Please take your phones out, um, scan the QR code and do the anonymous um, survey, it will help us um, understand the picture we have in our industry. So, uh, very grateful if you could all do that. Um, I want to thank everybody for attending. Um, Peter, I want to thank you as well. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Cause. Thank you, Deloitte. Thank you, New South Wales Government, Cyber CX, Victorian Government through. John's presence tonight, and uh, good news is so uh, we started the discussion with your successor, Dave Cohen. He is apologetic that he can't be here tonight. I should have mentioned that, but super enthusiastic. I think between the two of you, we've got some very strong advocates. And our mission here for Victoria, as we launch Cyber Minds here tonight, is to embrace you, to bring you in, to um, to seek your uh, guidance and also your advocacy, to become champions for this, to be part of our community that were, and, and be the, the centre of this activity, to support Kevin in his ambassadorial program, Andrew in his research, Richard and myself in the delivery of the programs and as we move through through our facilitators. And uh, I think with that, we've given this a very comprehensive coverage. Um, and uh, I just look forward to the next stage in this exciting journey as we change the human face of cybersecurity.